I would imagine that in the room there are points of view that don't necessarily agree with what's been said or the consensus that's been reached. So I believe it would be informative to listen to other perspectives, other ideas of people who perhaps have strong objections to the general consensus, which is to have a ecological taxation. I can see one hand going up already. It's not so much that I object to the principle, but I have a question. Perhaps I want to extend the scope of what's been said, lateral thinking a little. I belong to the Roosevelt uh, Collective. I believe that today we are at a European level negotiating a set of free trade treaties, which will lead to an increase in exchanges between parties around the world, which in turn means more transport, which means when we have more, okay, which says that we have more transport. Now, we should ensure that there is no distortion in competition. But local communities will no longer be able to choose local companies when they have other larger multinationals who will be able to outcompete perhaps local enterprises. Now, all of this poses a problem. Therefore, before taxation, before the question of taxation, how are we going to deal with these, uh, the TTP, the free trade agreements, for example, with the US or with Canada, which has just been, uh, which has just been negotiated? So my question is that before going into taxation, or how should we see fiscal measures against this bigger picture where there are contradictions uh, with what we're trying to achieve environmentally? I think that this could lead to a more general question, which is uh, economic deregulation in external trade. and the way globalization works and the link which exists with fiscal measures and taxation, even though it wasn't directly dealt with by our speakers. And that's, for example, the issue of uh, cross-border carbon taxes. Now, perhaps before going into a complete answer, we'll take a few more questions from the floor, and that'll give our speakers some time to think. My question. Veronique Badet, I work at the weekly magazine Pellerin. Okay, taxation is to generate revenue, taxes, but what for? Today, this morning, I was on a, a discussion about housing. There's a huge need for investment in renovating housing. Now, how do we find the funds to finance that investment? Is it public funds? Should we channel these revenues for these revenues. For me, energy transition is a need for investment above and beyond anything else. So are we talking about the same thing or is taxation about something else? Oui, François Hubert, rather than having taxes, Yesterday evening, we were told that whenever there was a little bit more money to be earned in oil underground, then we'd probably strive to extract it. Shouldn't it be necessary on a world level to globalize, pool fossil energy resources on a global scale in order to have an overall world tax pulled together with a supranational institute which sets a price for fossil fuels, which is then uniformly uh, 
uh, which increases uniformly and then would s solve the energy problem and would ensure that revenues, this comfortable revenue, can be used to resolve the various problems which exist in terms of climate change and uh, correction of imbalances, etc. One more question. I'd like to come back to the question about the cross-border tax. My question, perhaps the Swedish uh, Perhaps the Swedish uh, example could give us an element of an answer to this. What are the effects of delocalization and the impact of environmental measures? I can see that the Swedish approach was to set up an environmental tax by offsetting, other, offsetting it against other taxes, reducing other taxes. Or was there a, or did you have cases where uh, companies decided to leave the country because uh, they weren't taxed as heavily? So we have four questions. There are two questions, I believe, tie into the issue of taxation and free trade, international trade. One question on redistribution of uh, fiscal revenue. And one question, which is uh, alternative taxation, which is pooling of global resources, fixing a uh, global fixing of a global price and redistribution of the revenue. Okay, there are four basic questions. The first question, the question was raised in different ways. The last way you raised it was uh, the best, in my view. How does uh, national taxation fit into the global picture? The problem today is economic mechanisms uh, work on a global scale, and taxation is implemented at a national scale. And Europe, uh, uh, not even at a European scale, because uh, Europe uh, as an entity doesn't have much power in the field of uh, taxation, unless we're talking about Eurovignette. It's about limited to about that. In terms of a uh, freedom of movement of uh, people and goods, uh, that is one of the pillars of the European Union, uh, but only takes into account uh, to a very small level externalities, not like uh, Switzerland, uh, which uh, can uh, take into account the full impact of externalities. Now, personally, I don't see any solution in the short to medium term because member states uh, are absolutely against uh, loss of any sovereignty in the field of taxation. So for me, there is no uh, short or medium term solution to that. The second question from Mrs. Badet, I think it's another fundamental issue. We haven't spoken it because of lack of time. We have to distinguish two types uh, of uh, taxation, one which is incentivizing and the other one which is revenue generating. In my view, they are antagonistic. If you want an incentivizing tax, then you need a very narrow uh, threshold, very high uh, levels of taxation, and then a substitute pro uh, product. Uh, take a basic example. If a fear is a source of uh, cancer, if m milk, if butter was uh, found to be causing uh, cancer, then we would put a tax on butter, but then uh, reduce it on margarine. They would uh, shift their consumption then to margarine and non-cancer generating products. With uh, revenue generating taxes, they're low taxes, but across a broad range of products, but then there is no incentive. So the distinction that I've just drawn is somewhat artificial because you can, uh, and perhaps a drawing on the German example where experience shows us that we have uh, this double dividend uh, phenomenon and seems uh, to have worked in Germany. In the case of energy, why does it work? Well, because energy is something that everybody needs. So when you increase taxes 
adaptation behavior is assistance over the long term. So taxation is 90% of the environmental revenue. Now, from my point of view, I prefer incentivizing eco-taxation, even though there is a lot of objection, because uh, people believe that revenue is required to finance the energy transition. That's the point of view of, ON, of NGOs. For example, earmarking, uh, NGOs uh, say that we need an agency for the reaffectation. But when we've got over a billion euros in debt, the priority is to reduce the debt and the servicing of that debt. Otherwise, uh, there'll be no money left to, to help the environment. Now, that's another question, and we don't all agree upon. On the issue of um, globalization of fossil energies, I don't think that's very ris uh, realistic. And you have different types of fossil fuels. The prices are different. The taxation, the tax regimes will be different. Now, the impact of taxation on delocalization, yes, that's important. There have been many studies on the matter which show generally that uh, the impact of environmental taxation in countries such as France is very low on competition, on competitivity, competitiveness of uh, countries. And it only represents a fraction of uh, their social contributions. Now, of course, uh, some companies will say that this is being added to a heavy, already heavy burden of social contributions. And so the impact, the overall impact of the environmental tax on delocalization is actually quite low. What I do believe is true, however, is the impact of delocalization due to the cost of energy of which taxes are part. But in France, this isn't so much the case because, as you know, energy is very cheap. With uh, Finland, we are amongst the cheapest uh, countries for energy, which poses other problems, which means uh, that the price signals being sent out are very weak and uh, the people are not incentivized to consume less energy, contrary to countries like Germany, where it's very expensive. Uh, yes, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I can add uh, on a couple of issues here. Uh, first of all, when we, I'd like to make it clear, when we talk about an environmental tax, of course, a good environmental tax is actually the one that will cease to exist, because it has a purpose, it wants to, to uh, punish something, and when that doesn't exist anymore, then the tax shouldn't be, be there. And, of course, that means that you get less revenue, and that's why you, you need to complement environmental taxes on energy also with a broad, stable energy tax on a, on a broad tax base, so uh, preferably on all energy carriers uh, based on the same uh, amount of money per gigajoule per energy content. And we are walk working in that direction in, in Sweden through to, to separate the, the tax systems. Uh, then to uh, some other points that was raised about uh, a global price on CO2, a global CO2 tax. Well, th that would really be the best best idea, of course. I don't think ever there would be an agreement on that, not in our lifetime anyway, and definitely not on how to spend it. So I think that's really a utopia, something that we can't achieve. Uh, now on to us that some, someone raised the border tax, tax adjustments. Well, Sweden is a, is a country that traditionally is, it's a small economy, very export oriented, so we very strongly believe in free trade. So uh, uh, we are not particularly keen on, on border tax adjustments. But on the other hand, we have a, a heavy, heavy um, export oriented industry, so that's why we, we choose to have these two, two levels of taxation. A lower level, still high internationally, but a lower level for those subject to international competition. And we have, we, uh, by striking that balance, we have been able to make good environmental results by still uh, uh, preventing uh, any significant carbon leakage. And we think that is a, it's a good solution. So 
really. Thank you. I don't. I, I'm not against border tax adjustment. I think there is a certain fairness that can be found. As for the allocation of resources, that's a very important subject, and Guillaume, I, I would disagree with Guillaume on that. I'd be up for having within the domestic tax system taxes linked to the environment because you need to pay these taxes one way or another and I would rather pay them on pollution on natural natural resources in favor of an energy transition rather than pay them through my work or through my company so in between the two I would pr I would favor tax based on the environmental impact and energy impact of the market But this is at least down to the fact that there are many options and politicians have many options. You can reduce public debt, which is a key issue in Italy. You can transfer taxation. We can make use of the positive effects of environmental taxation. And as Guillaume mentioned, we are asking environmental policy makers, energy transition policy makers, we're asking much more of them than other policy makers which is a tradition of the environmental community wanting to be transparent and participative. We try to justify and demonstrate everything to everyone and get everyone's agreement. And surely in transport or traditional energy or defense policy, uh, the requirements are not so stringent and th th you need to think maybe of a fairness among policy and po uh, uh, different types of politics. So the idea of uh, overall management of energy prices is a very uh, interesting idea. It could be a long-term idea. But there are many problems because there is a worldwide market, but the markets are never fully worldwide because petrol oil costs are marginal. You can only act on the marginal part of the cost, and it's ne we ne you can never s have a single management of the market which is compartmentalized by countries, zones, and regions. I had prepared two slides which could be useful to see what happens at European level. If we at European level could manage to do things together, that would be a huge step forward. We have a common economic policy. We have a right to look at each other huh, in different countries. and. We don't have a common tax policy, however, which I think is one of the reasons for the failures, for the failings of the EU. We need more Europe and therefore more common taxation, not give up on the budgetary and economic, the common budgetary and economic policies. The problem of unanimity in tax decisions at European level is a terrible one. It, all we need is for one of the 28 member states to be opponents, uh, such as our British friends who are all up for sovereignty in this regard. All they need is to oppose a measure for it not to be passed. We thought the carbon tax was ready at European level because of Jacques Delors' work and Alberto Maia, who is an Italian economist. It was all ready for Rio 92, and, and yet the uh, and yet British, a British finger was raised and other national interests came into play and we arrived to the developing countries with a, with a much less credible and strong position. It's no surprise that the ETS market of Kyoto, Kyoto was introduced in Europe. It's because we didn't manage to introduce a carbon tax which required unanimity, whereas the, market of emi the emissions market is considered an environmental measure and it has a normal procedure by majority vote even though it's a market-based instrument. Nevertheless, we don't necessarily need fiscal unanimity. We can take autonomous measures, national measures, and make the most of the margins provided by institutional mechanisms of enhanced cooperation. Schengen or the Euro are models of this type of cooperation. We've institutionalized them afterwards. We need a minimum of nine countries of the 28 that can work together within the European framework. You can also think of 
coalitions of the willing or like-minded countries. It has negative connotations after the experiments in Iraq and so on, but you can also call them like-minded countries, so countries that can work together. With some colleagues, we saw four sectors where we could work among willing countries. Aviation, for example, the kerosene tax exemption gives an advantage to the aviation sector, and there's no reason that we should we should uh, give them such an advantage at international level. It's an international convention of 1945 of the International Civil Aviation Organization. They, they prepared the future very well at the time. Um, tourism can be justified. There, there can be cooperation in that field. Excessive use of pesticides and fertilizers, that has a major impact on the use of water, and on energy, and obviously CO2 taxation, where several countries Sweden is one of the trailblazers, but many other countries are, are making efforts, such as Great Britain, in parts of the market that aren't covered by the ETS. International treaties, the tra free trade treaties, as was mentioned, are a threat. And they are on the borderlines of our conversation today, but there isn't, it isn't a priority. You need to work on all, all these levels to the same extent. I was in Brussels because we, as in, at the presidency of the Council in Europe, we have prepared a conference for the Global Conference on Bio. We've prepared the Global Conference on Biodiversity. So how difficult it is for our 28 countries to find a common position. And so we decided, for example, we decided to double international aid to development in terms of biodiversity, and everyone went home happy, satisfied, but as an economist, I'll see that objective of doubling aid to biodiversity at international level, I'll see that there's no responsibility set for each country. It's an overall objective. We need to meet it together, but there's no accountability for each country. And a country such as Denmark or Sweden or Norway, which already gives 1% of its GDP to development aid. Why should it double its development aid? They, they already make a major effort. A country like Italy that, that donates 0.14% of, it, of its GDP could make an effort, but that's difficult for that country at a time of economic crisis. But So finding ways of building worldwide consensus is very difficult, but we need to work on that. The climate conference in Paris late 2015, in Lima in 2014, we'll also be in Korea in October. So we need to work on all levels, be it tax and ec ecological reform, trans energy transition policies, the COP. We need to make, take all the trains going in the right direction. I'm going to take a series of questions now. Fabien Toquet from the French Red Cross. Guillaume Satney mentioned the need to for for predictability and progressiveness of green taxation. How did the Swedes manage to have that predictability in spite of your uh, changing governments? Do your institutions allow for long-term policies? What's your secret? There are elections are next Sunday, so be careful, Susan. So Didier Venin, I work for EDF, I work for the Greater Paris Region. I was very interested to hear your words on considering that environmental policies are more or less a Trojan horse. 
with regard to social justice or vulnerability. I have somewhat different opinion, and I just want to feed it into the debate. As I worked on our solidarity policy within EDF and GDF, I get the feeling that there are other, there are other public policies are divesting themselves of their responsibilities in, in that field, and it's environmental policies that have taken on that burden. I didn't... You, you didn't mention Trojan horse, Mr. saint but to me it's the feeling of a collective di divestment of responsibility and uh, the fact that it's a burden on others now. Now, Mr. saint in what you were saying about tax reductions, do you include the CSPE, the public service contribution of electricity, which represents one-third of the bills for households and various political choices were made to that end 10 to 15 years ago when that mechanism was put in place. And the share of that contribution for that was quite large and yet it's become a smaller and smaller share because there was a public policy in France which was to subsidize re renewable energies which has had an impact on the message that's given to people. The, the, the. And as for your final, the final question, taxation on international trade, some of the issues we're facing with the electricity trade is the, the increasing power of data centers, IT servers, which use a whole, a, a, a lot of in electricity and we use them several times a day whenever we use our mobile phones, such as the person who's sitting right in front of me. Whenever we use an IT server, that uses energy. And so there should be taxation, but there's nowhere to situate the taxation, not even within a country. So how could we set up a taxation system and I'm thinking of a recent American study. For example, if you use Facebook today, you produce as much CO2 as if you were preparing a cup of tea using a kettle, which is a major tax issue, one could say. Third question? Okay. Hello. Hi. Okay. Yeah, I was... Um, this is about the global, the carbon tax, whether the idea of a global or a national one. Um, when I was actually presenting earlier at the workshop three, I was showing one slide uh, from a study which uh, really in showed warnings that if uh, we only put a crude CO2 tax onto fossil fuels and ignore everything else, uh, then there's a real danger of inadvertently promoting um, especially large-scale bioenergy and that, that could, um, could, or could result in um, even greater what's called biogenic emissions, emissions from land use change, from soil carbon loss, etc., and have devastating results for biodiversity. So if you're simply looking at a fossil fuel-based CO2 tax uh, as a tool, uh, what are the views of, uh, of presenters of um, how that can, how, that, how one can avoid really potentially quite major uh, unwanted negative effects. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, for the f first question by the French Red Cross, of course, uh, our politicians are not any different in Sweden than they are in other countries. They change their minds, and uh, we, we also change governments <laughs> once in a while. But when it comes to the base, as I was saying in my presentation, the, 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 there has been and there still is a broad consensus on the basic structure of the Swedish design of the, of the system. And uh, as Aldo was so rightly pointing out, we have a parliamentary election coming up this Sunday, and uh, there may be a shift of government, and, uh, but we don't see any major changes. If there is any changes, there will be that the Green Party will come into government and then part of the government and then will be even more green, I would say, most likely. 
And also we have a four-year uh, um, election period, so each government sits for quite a long time. Uh, another issue that was brought up by the gentleman on that side was the data centers. It's uh, actually, of, of the data centers are, are also having, uh, when, when you have your Facebook, when you check into your Facebook, they, 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 all the data has to be stored somewhere at a server. And those servers are situated up in the north, in Finland and Sweden, because it's so cold up there. And believe me, we charge electricity tax on them. So at least some, to some extent. Uh, then to your question at the end, I mean, I, I list, listened with interest to your uh, presentation or discussion this morning, and I can't say I agree because uh, you, you, you. Oh, that's the micro, the, the mobile phones. Uh, that uh, because we do have in the EU sustainable sustainability criteria that takes into account land use and, and other things, and it's only the sustainable biofuels that are that don't pay CO2 tax in Sweden, and it may not be a perfect system, but it's a start. We are having the ELUC discussions within the EU to, to improve the, the this system, and. So, I mean, also in Sweden, we're trying to move away from the first generation biofuels and into, into second and even third generation. And I'd like to mention one uh, product that's uh, been developed in Sweden, Finland, and also in the Netherlands, I believe. It's HVO, hydrated vegetable oil. It's a, it's a diesel. It has the same characteristics, the same energy value as a fossil diesel, but it's made by residues from the, for, from the forest industry and it can be used in the regular motors, and it's a, it, it's a great potential for, for future, and it's, uh, it's definitely second generation. It doesn't compete with food. So, I mean, what you need to do in the future is to, to try and concentrate on the areas, on the biofuels that don't compete with the, with the food production. You can do the wood scrap, and particularly waste. We have a lot of waste in all our countries, and take care of those waste. Of course, first, not generate as much waste as we do, but secondly, make use of the waste and do, do it into biogas or heat our houses with it, take care of the different the products we have, and we will come a long way, I think. Thank you. So, difficult question on CSTE for Mr. Santini. So, there are a few questions within your question. Now, my introductory words were provocative to to give to really stoke a bit of a debate, so, so which is good for a symposium. But fundamentally speaking, I don't remember ever receiving an invitation to a symposium on how to incorporate environmental concerns into social policies, even as the reversed question is uh, is often raised in symposiums, which is a good thing, but. It does show that environmental concerns are very, uh, so, so many policies are impervious to environmental concerns. Now, the issue of energy poverty, you're right. This is an issue that's resurfacing from an environmental perspective, but it's not an environmental issue, it's a social issue. From a strictly environmental perspective, just imagine. Let, let's imagine that uh, only the environment counts. We would have to get rid of all social benefits or regulated tariffs. We'd have to get rid of all checks which, which can have a detrimental environmental effect. So there's less of an impact when it's for electricity, which doesn't produce as much CO2 in France than for gas. Now for now, if you look at the economic perspective, if you talk with an economist about social tariffs and, and controlled tariffs, then to him it's completely anti-economical. So you can see it's a, this issue brings together all kinds of different considerations, and that's always the case in policy making. But on the other issues, beyond energy poverty, I still believe that if you look at health, which is linked to social issues, the fact there's a lack of public tradition in public health and epidemiology in France compared to curative uh, 
health care is because environmental concerns have never entered into, po into health policies in France. With regard to the CSP, I do agree with you. Everyone's accusing it of all kinds of ills, but we've forgotten two things. Don't forget it's m much higher in, in Germany, its equivalent, and up to 2010, the social and parasocial components of the CSP were majority shares. And for example, the repurchasing tariffs for fossil fuel energy generation centers and uh, it's only from 2011 that ENRs became a majority share. Now, the issue of whether France's choice is in its climate policy to, to favor renewable energies compared to saving energy. I don't know if it's a poor choice in itself. I, I do think it's important to support renewable energies. France does have a low carbon economy. Its emissions of greenhouse gases don't come from en electricity production. They are in sectors in which CO2 is emitted, uh, and for example, in the agricultural policy and the agricultural sector, for example, is the third em emitter in France, which is completely different from other parts of Europe. And whilst I do have the floor, I just wanted to say a few words on, since our Swedish colleague is with us, it was a very interesting example that was given in the comparison between France and Sweden, and to respond to what ma Ms. Bannett said is, so uh, there's a tax on nitrous oxide in France, which was set at 45 euros per ton. So nitrous oxide, which is a less well uh, known pollutant than CO2, but it's very dangerous. So also, uh, Microscopic particles are, are a dangerous thing, but we don't consider them as much. So, in the in the last l reform, that uh, the that rate of tax would has increased two to threefold. It's now roughly 140 euros per ton. So one could think that's an excellent measure. It's a very successful reform. The only problem and I would ask Madam Atkinson to, to check what I'm saying is that the taxation rate in Sweden is 5,500 5, euros per ton, whereas we've only moved from 45 to 440 euros. And the value of a ton of nox, nitrous oxide in France is a little over 5,000 euros. So if you want green taxation to to target externalities the ton of emitted nitrous oxide in france should be taxed to the level of 7000 euros and why is it only taxed at 140 euros well it's because these types of taxes were considered as financing taxes to to feed into certain structures and their functioning and so that's how their rates were set whereas in the Swedish case and perhaps Madam Ackerfeld could uh, confirm this if they, they are calculated to have a dissuasive effect um, you can see a different in a difference in how the policies are conceived of I just wanted to say a few words on the attempt to have a global carbon tax, which is very difficult, and we can already see how difficult it is at European level. Just to give you two pictures, you probably know this gentleman. Look him in the eye. He's the man who won the elections in Australia, so the prime minister of a very important economy. 
and much of his campaign was based on getting rid of the carbon tax which the government on the other side wanted to introduce. It wasn't even a carbon tax, it was an ETS, it was a market. But he called it the carbon tax and that had a huge positive effect in, and led to him winning the election. This gentleman here, some of you may recognize, he is the first, the Prime Minister of Morocco, Abdel Ben Kirin. For social region, reasons, subsidies often have a strong basis in social concerns. In Europe, we subsidize a great deal the use of fossil fuels. And as you can see here, those subsidies have increased greatly between 2006 and 2011 from 0.5 to 5.5 of the GDP. So we often think we've got to help a country develop, so we've got to increase its, its use of petrol, of oil, of diesel and so on. So before we manage to have a global carbon tax, we need a lot more work, for example, on, on the price of carbon, to change policies in our individual countries, and it, it'll be a much more long-term process. Secondly, we can't consider a common tax for the US, France, Morocco, South Africa, the same tax, because a much lower tax in Morocco or South Africa would have the same impact as it would have in wealthier countries. So you need fairness over time and fairness between countries and social groups. Our time's nearly up, but perhaps since we started at five past, we could. Uh, yeah, just, just to answer the question about our nitrogen uh, fee. It's a fee in Sweden, not a tax, but it's uh, it's about five euro per kilo, which will be like 5,500 euro per, per ton, that's right. But uh, ac accidentally, we're thinking it's too low, so we're thinking of raising it. Try <laughs> <laughs> and be quick, because we don't have much time left, but since the idea is of uniform, uniformity in European taxes, one thing that hasn't been mentioned, and you're specialists in this regard, is the issue of the level of provision of equipment in different countries. And if you impose a carbon tax, and at popular level people reject these, these measures, it's not because people are not environmentally friendly or concerned, it's the fact that in regions or countries where there are small, little alternatives, obviously Sweden is a success because it's much better equipped than us in terms of mobility, in terms of vehicles, in terms of level of equipment, in housing and so on. People can't be forced to, well, you can't sacrifice the living if if the things are going to if the measures are going to strangle them and also you mentioned social charges and since i work for a collective that fights against inclusion i would say that someone paying a eight, 1800 euros energy bill in a very poorly insulated house then their, their benefits uh, only amount to 75 euros. So the, this idea that people are, people's energy bills are fully paid, that's, that's not necessarily a very truthful picture of the true situation. Drive de Vray, I also work for a advisory committee on energy transition within the Catholic Church. I just wanted to give you a comment on the presentations. Perhaps you can tell me what you think of it. In the presentations, apart from the final words we, we just heard, we didn't hear about the criteria for these types of policy. For me, the important criteria are to eliminate CO2 and also save Im on imported energy. So even if a carbon tax is not politically easy to implement, I think in all these tax policies, the idea of a cost of 
avoided CO2 should be the major, major reference point. It needs saying because this has a huge impact afterwards. So I did appreciate in, in Mr. Uh, uh, sorry, in Madam Ackerfeld's words, the the mention that the measures need to be cost effective, so at the lowest possible cost. And in our, con our current situation, we need to seek efficiency in terms of CO2 as well. So there are some win-win measures I'd also mention because anything that saves energy. Obviously, you have an investment, but there's a return on investment behind that. So taxation should allow the return time, return on investment time to be s suitable for companies and individuals, which won't cost so much. And it'll bring benefits because it'll create employment as well. So you need to consider the overall economic benefits. The symposium organizers have shown that I do need to stop. But I might leave Guillaume Satni to say a few more words on what has just been said. Now, I fully agree with you, Madam. Uh, no one's in thinking of introducing taxes uh, on a completely arbitrary basis. It's in France, it's the parliament that decides on this. And as you've pointed out, there are various taxes that have been rejected. So it's, it's one of history's free features is that there's always been taxes that have led to revolutions. So that's perfectly normal. Secondly, if the bill on energy transition goes from social tariffs to an energy check system, there will be a very heated debate in the parliament on the inclusion or not of, of fuel in those energy checks, replacing gas and electricity subsidies by checks would be a good thing, but so it's very good. Socially speaking, it's a tricky from an environmental perspective. It's good for fairness within generations, but not good for fairness between generations, because there will always be repercussions of these measures later on and the impact will be higher on those more vulnerable categories. So there will be a debate even within the current parliamentary majority. And I think you're right to mention energy placements. The best measure is not social tariffs or checks. It's to, to stop poorly insulated houses, housing. And this is also a sector that create that generates a lot of employment. The energy transition can help reduce unemployment figures, and this will also d decrease the amount of fossil fuel imports, which can increase the trade or decrease the trade deficit. Now, to add on what Aldo mentioned earlier, who he reminded us there are about 450. I I was thinking more like 500 billion euros of subsidies to, energy, to fossil fuels around the world. We should remember that more than four-fifths of those subsidies are in emerging and developing countries. OECD countries have significantly decreased their subsidies in this regard, and that needs to be taken into account in social fairness criteria. Those countries most financing their fossil fuels are Iran, Venezuela, Mexico, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Abu Dhabi, India, China, Russia. That includes poor countries, but also wealthy countries, emerging or developing countries. And if 400 of those 500 billion subsidies were removed, that would have a huge impact, much more than, than the, that of the energy checks in France. 